All right. Hello and welcome. This is a new quarter for the encounter. It's going to be for the summer and we're going to be talking about the Psalms. And today I have two new writers. This will be the first time that uh, our audience has not read something written by me or Logan Dixon or Reverend Becky. So uh, we've been three months just doing it ourselves. So it's good to have new blood and I look forward to uh, talking about the themes and things that we're going to encounter here for the the Psalms. And before I get into that, or before we get into that, I want to give uh, Dr. Qualls and Dr. D a chance to just tell about themselves. And um, we'd love to hear about your ministries and your and your callings. So Dr. Qualls, how about you go? And then we'll go with D. Thank you, Chris. Uh, joy to be with you and to uh, write for the encounter. I cut my teeth in a little Cumberland Presbyterian Church uh, studying the encounter. Uh, the adult Sunday school class always had the encounter and, and perhaps some other resources. So I'd always been uh, an admirer from a distance and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, write a series of lessons. It was, um, it was quite challenging, uh, especially given the circumstances. And, uh, but it was, it was a, a true delight of my heart. And so I, I hope it's uh, helpful to the people who uh, have a chance to, to peruse it. Um, most people know who I am, who will be seeing this, but just in case, uh, Michael Qualls, I am the Director of the Program of Alternate Studies and the Common Presbyterian House of Studies for Memphis Theological Seminary. More importantly, I am a pastor and been a pastor all my life. Uh, since I was 19 years old, I've been pastor in a pastoral leadership position at church, uh, which was a number of years ago. And more importantly than that, I am a husband of Rhonda and, uh, and I have adult children and grandchildren that are such a joy. And my 94 year old mother lives with us as well. Very good. <laughs> Full life. Um, you are muted, I'm afraid, my friend. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm on now. Okay. Are, are we good? Okay, so Dr. D, I do not, this will be the first time that I've met you. And so, first of all, how do you pronounce your name the correct way? So I, <laughs> I do that when people ask me. And then tell me about how you got to West Tennessee Presbytery and, and let us know what you're doing. Thank you so very much, sir. Uh, my name is Ademola Shedendi. Uh, I go by D for ease of uh, reference, especially uh, for people here in the U.S., uh, originally, I'm from Nigeria, and I've been in the U.S. now for close to 20 years. Uh, I've been in the ministry for for years. I mean, I, I had my first time of preaching, uh, my first formal preaching in a cathedral in Nigeria at the age of uh, 17, and I've been in the ministry uh, since that time. Uh, here in the U.S., I came into the U.S. close to 20 years, or, or there are about 20 years, like I said, and I've... Uh, been part of the United Methodist, I've been part of uh, the Baptist tradition, and I'm in the process of uh, getting my credentials uh, affirmed by uh, the CPC Church, and I've been in the recent times. I just finished uh, uh, taking classes to know a lot about CP, and I really thank God for the things that uh, I've been able to learn from great professors like Michael <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And Andy and uh, uh, so many people uh, that uh, that I had to uh, go through, Doctor Doctor uh, Matthews. Yeah. I'm not sure whether I said that name right. He, he taught us the history. Um, so um, I'm in the process. I, I preach uh, uh, online uh, a program that I call uh, the Word in Brief every week. I also do a Bible study uh, in the program that I call uh, the Visit of the Lord. Uh, I manage uh, a ministry called the uh, Calvary Gathering Ministry, and I involve myself with other uh, ministries in town where we do food distributions and uh, engage in community work. Uh, in the next few weeks or months, I should be full time by the grace of God with uh, CPC. I'm in the process of uh, preaching go. here and there. Last week I was with Faith. Uh, this week I'll be preaching in, uh, at uh, Germantown. Uh, two weeks after that I'll be in Union City. The week after that I'll be somewhere in Arkansas. So God is opening uh, hey, doors for me and I'm really grateful for that. 
And I'm really grateful for Michael Quells for uh, bringing me in to uh, be able to be part of this. Uh, I'm really delighted and excited uh, to be part of the body of Christ. I'm married uh, to adult children, uh, doing fine. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Does sound like you're going to be busy coming up. Tuesday, so <laughs> that's good. Um, I will also say I have uh, Leo, the super dog, with us in the background. We're hoping that he is going to be a good boy uh, for the next 25, 30 minutes or so. If not, please you're forgive me. Hoping, you're just hoping we will be good boys. Yes, that too. That too. Uh, during this COVID lockdowns and things and having to stay home, sometimes you have to you have to do uh, gymnastics, it seems like, just to make everything work. So, um, so coming into this summer quarter, um, I'm going to go ahead and just read the description that we have for it. In the summer 2021 quarter of the encounter, uh, Michael Qualls and Dr. D lead us through selected psalms. In graphic and poetic language, the book of Psalms served to guide the Hebrews to awareness and then worship of the ever-present God. They remain a valuable resource for leading Christians into deeper faith for such a time as this. This summer, join us in our journey with the psalmist into deeper wisdom and worship, both as communities of faith and as individuals of faith. So that was the assignment that I gave Dr. Qualls uh, to uh, try to try to help us out. One of the reasons is because I uh, the narrative lectionary stops in the summertime and it gives churches freedom to explore different areas of, of the scriptures instead of just the, you know, the main storylines. And so I decided that summer times were going to be used for wisdom literature. And so Psalms this year, next summer is going to be um, Ecclesiastes and Job uh, written by Dr. Estes. That'll be fun to read. But so we did the Psalms uh, because I think the Psalms can help us in worship. Uh, they're sometimes not read as much. People who use the narrative lecture or the revised common lectionary hardly ever choose to preach from the Psalms. Um, and so I thought it'd be good to at least explore what our Old Testament brethren used as their worship hymnal and their worship God uh, and, and see how it can help us in our faith today. And so in the first four lessons of the uh, summer encounter, that's the month of June, Psalms kind of opens its opens the book with Psalm 1 about two ways you can live. It's what scripture would call a way of wisdom or the way of folly or ignorance, however you'd like to say it. And so um, I think I just want to open up the discussion to you two guys to just say, how does the Psalms help us in understanding wisdom? And how do the Psalms just present wisdom to us? What is wisdom? Because I'm thinking in our world today, you probably have two different understandings of wisdom either wisdom from above or streetwise or, you know, common sense. What, what does all this mean? But you can answer that any way you want to, but yeah, specifically, how can we uh, use the Psalms in gaining wisdom from God? Uh, I'll jump in and, and just uh, get us started off. Um, I am aware and, and many people who will read the lessons will be aware that uh the Hebrew people didn't invent wisdom literature. The wisdom literature existed uh, in, the, in the broader culture, but the Hebrews uh, understood wisdom literature, including the Psalms, as a um, as a revelation, as divine revelation of uh, who God is and what God is doing in the world and how specifically God is entering into their life experience. And so uh, while I would not have chosen the specific Psalms that we ultimately uh, <laughs> for our lessons, <laughs> uh, it's like the lectionary. Sometimes it's very good discipline to just go to, to, to you know, be forced to go to places you wouldn't go. So yes, wisdom and righteousness or our wisdom and foolishness or um, the way of righteousness as opposed to uh, the way of wickedness. Uh, those are synonymous through uh, from the Hebrew uh, wisdom literature. Uh, they're just two, they're two, it's a, it's, I don't have a binary understanding of the world, but I think to, to really clearly understand the Hebrew world, you have to understand that you chose one path or the other path. And so the way of wickedness or the way of foolishness, uh, which might seem apparent, as uh, uh, Jesus would say, apparently it looks like a good path. 
but it doesn't lead where we think it would lead, we, where we want the bright uh, neon lights that, that, that wave and, and focus us in this direction will not lead to the life of fulfillment, happiness, and ultimate uh, relationship with Yahweh. And so for the Hebrew, th those are the two choices, a life, and, and a, the other way of saying it is life of Yahweh's path or life of your own choosing. Right. And uh, so that's, I, I don't, I can speak all day. He can go all day with it. Yeah. Uh, Dr. D, I know you, you've said that you come from Nigeria. So is there a difference in how you've, you've seen the American church understand biblical wisdom, revelation, and how you were taught or learned growing up? Or, um... Yeah, there is. There is. I mean, it's, it's different. And the difference came uh, over time. Um, it's like what is going on now, if I want, if I want to look at it from the contemporary view, uh, in Nigeria and developing countries in terms of when we talk of faith, it's a different ball of game altogether. It's like there has been a shift over the past few years uh, from talking about wisdom today. And uh, uh, like we said, wisdom is either from the area of um, two kinds of people that, that live in the world, uh, either the wise people or the foolish people. And um, like I normally say, when we talk about uh, wisdom or being wise or being foolish, um, it's either we know, I, I normally say that uh, two kinds of people live in the world, those that know and those that do not know. Uh, those that know, uh, they be wise, and those that know may know that they do not know. In other words, people that are really foolish are people that uh, do not know and are not aware that they do not know. So talking of self-awareness. So I look at Psalms that we are looking at today uh, from the perspective of it's either I know or I don't know. And when I don't know, I should know that I don't know. So that knowing that I don't know, I can be open to know what I need to know. And when we look at it from God's revelation and man's revelation, speak revelation, we need to allow to know God's mind so that it can lead us for us to be able to interpret to what we are going on in our day-to-day -day world. Uh, talking about difference in uh, Nigeria, Africa, and here, uh, generally in terms of uh, faith, uh, it seems as if there has been a, a, a paradox, a, a shift. Uh, I will say from my experience living here now that Christians in this part of the world live as Christians, they live in reality of day to day. Christians in developing countries live in a kind of what I would call utopia, what they think ought to be or what had been in the past, not what is right, what they're experiencing in the now. It's like uh, talking about, uh, we're looking for the coming Messiah. I mean, not seeing the fact that Messiah is already here. I mean, looking for God, not looking at the environment to see that God is already in this environment. It's like, how do we relate with this God? How do we uh, put ourselves in the hands of God that God, this is who I am. There's no pretense. You are my creator. You are my maker. So I can't hide anything from you. Like the Sami will say, where will I hide from God? If I go, the best part of the earth is there. If I go up, is there. Wherever I go, is there. So why not let us be who we are, like um, uh, part of what we'll be talking about today is uh, lamentation, that when we are wrong, when we sin, why don't we want to be straightforward with God and with ourselves that, God, I messed up. I missed it. Have mercy on me. Don't let me be like Dr. Quartz and just keep on going on and on. <laughs> It's what you get when you get a couple of people who like to think about stuff. That, that's the way it works. Um, one of the things that I'd noticed just after I, when I took this job, I stopped preaching every Sunday at one church and I, I got into scripture and I just noticed from the Old Testament, whether it's in the, the first five books or if it's the prophets or wisdom literature in the New Testament, this theme of the two ways, knowledge or wisdom and folly, just go throughout. Like Jesus talks about, you know, a foundation of sand or foundation of rock. Paul says, you know, live life by the spirit or live life by the flesh. But just in every single, just in every single section of the scriptures, there's this two ways presented. And it's either the way of, of, of wisdom or it's the way of folly. And so 
Um, I've, I've appreciated studying that and hearing it. I guess what I heard from both of you is, is that wisdom is knowing the mind of God. And the only way that we know the mind of God is through revelation. Is that, I mean, to, to submit to God, either through scripture or in prayer or whatnot. And we, we try to put on the mind of God in some way. Uh, yes. One of the things I say is you can't learn how to swim without getting wet. Uh, our, our diving in is part of the knowing. Uh, you can't know and then, and then move forward. You have to, it's the, the act of faith and, and the knowing comes hand in hand. And I think that, as you say, it, it's, that's consistent through scripture uh, all the way to the end. I talk about it in one of the Psalms that I wrote about, and frankly, it's been a long time, so I don't really remember for sure which one or what, but I talk about the, the two worlds, the, the unseen world that is every much as present and important as the world of our senses, um, and yet it requires us to learn how to navigate in that new world. I believe I used the example where my wife nearly was run down by an, an automobile that was traveling in the wrong lane when we were in Japan. Because in our worldview, that's everybody knows what side of the road you're supposed to drive on, but it's it's exactly the opposite in that world. And so navigating the spiritual world, the world of knowing God, uh, you know, means that we have to recognize that there's another an, another set of par another set of paradigms, another set of um, guidelines and be as i think the word you just submit be willing to submit to the rules of engagement that apply in that other world uh, and that's part of our study i just love that we go into the psalms uh, I, uh, because they give us an opportunity to see that other world that's what i think the psalmists have done yes there are laments there are there's cries of anger there, everything that human sp spirit feels um, but but they invite us to come aside from what we know and begin to learn this other way, this other world. Yeah. I think that's a good, add, good way. I would like to add quickly to that, just sure. uh, uh, affirming what uh, uh, Dr. Mike just said, that uh, we have to be open to uh, let ourselves go, to be vulnerable, to be God and not put up all this wall that, okay, I know these, I know that, I've done these, I've done that. Uh, we should come to God with a open heart that God, what do I need to know now? Like when we look through some, we see the motive of, uh, God, this is what I've done. This is what I'm doing. I'm studying your word. I've done that. Teach me. <laughs> In other words, I've been able to do this, but I don't know whether I'm doing it right or wrong. Let me know the right thing to do. So we ought to approach God with an open heart of, I need to know God better, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Thank you. Very good. I think it's a James, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, ask, God will give it, right? So, um, so the next then kind of portion that I had in my mind that when we had the way of wisdom or the way of folly in those next, I'd say, eight or seven uh, Psalms, I wanted to focus on uh, worship, because ultimately the Psalms were used in worship in the Old Testament. And for many denominations, uh, people might not know this, like many denominations, especially Reformed Presbyterian churches, they still just sing the Psalms. Sometimes they just do the Psalms with no, with no piano, right? So um, it's still around, and I think it's good for us. When I was trying to figure out the scriptures to use, I thought in my mind, the old, uh, probably I learned as a child, the Acts, uh, mnemonic or device, you know, or adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Um, and so I tried to pattern some of these um, scriptures to that. And so um, first, I think the Psalms present God a certain way to be worshiped, right? Like they, the Psalms understand God, especially in the Hebrew context, a lot different than maybe their, the Hebrews neighboring cultures. God was a particular he was a personality god or we say god is a personality not a force not some energy or whatnot and god was merciful and god was wise and these kinds of things um and then the nature of god led the hebrews to praise him 
right? And and then we have like the acts of creation. We have God's mercy and God's love as as reasons to pray, praise God. And then I wanted to get into confession a little bit because uh, confession is an act of worship. And some of our um, more liturgical Carmel and Presbyterian churches, you still have a call to confession. You have a prayer confession, and then you have an absolution or, or a uh, assurance of pardon. And so I think it's an important part of worship. So anyway, I think what I'll do is I'll just open it up to both of y'all and say, how do the Psalms lead us in worship? And what, what are the important things the Psalms would say you do in worship, right? Like, is there a certain way to worship or is there, you know, restrictions on how to worship? These kinds of things. Just talk a little bit about how you understand the theology of the Psalms in worship. E, why don't you take this one first? <laughs> okay. All right, I'll go. Um, That's what you say when you don't have a ready answer. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, Psalms. The Book of Psalms help us to worship God, like we've been saying uh, uh, from the beginning today. That uh, when we come to God, we come into God with a clean heart. A clean heart, not meaning uh, a heart that is uh, washed clean, like we look at clean, but a heart that is open, that is available like a table are ready to uh, receive from God. And uh, of course, Psalms help us to see who we are. Psalms help us to uh, look around us to see the beautiful to see, uh, the beautiful presence of God around us, to see what God has done, what God is doing, to see things that God is capable of doing and all that. And to, I mean, some of, some of the Psalms, songs of, of Psalms, uh, alluded to the things that God had done to the Israelites, like when they are ascending, when they are going to Jerusalem and all that. Uh, and so in Psalms, we are in a position to be more self-aware that, okay, this is who we are. We are not in the same place. We are not as great. We are not as good as God is, but God still relates and have relationship with us that we can come to God where we are and we can be better the more we uh, read the word of God, the more we uh, relate with him, we'll be able to say, oh, uh, if God is this holy and uh, I can be holy too, uh, but then uh, I ought not to be doing this. So we, 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 begin to, we begin to glean from God. Let me put it that way. Uh, we begin to learn from him, from our interaction, from our relationship. And the songs that are in Psalms, I mean, it's, it's like, uh, when I read Psalms, it's like, this is somebody just writing from their heart, not writing to impress somebody, not writing to please somebody, or writing to say it as it is. Dr. Quiles. Well, let me say, I love the way you said that, because like, I've always thought, man, sometimes the church gets so caught up in policing, and we don't get caught up in just worship like and and the psalms presents a way of transformation through worship and not just to do this do that do this, do this exactly do and then when i hear you talking i, I kind of hear you saying from out of psalm 8 to where you know where we see this majesty of god and and where it's reflected in the special creation of humanity in the world and uh so we see our we are reflections of God. We're images of God and God is majestic and holy and we are too, right? And we mess it up. But anyway, creation and all that good stuff. All right, Dr. Qual, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, good. I appreciate you both uh, weighing in there. Um, so a shout out to uh, Psalm 8 uh, and a shout out to my high school creative writing teacher, uh, Mary Jo Barnett. Uh, by the way, most of these uh, people in, that I write about um, are alive today, and uh, I can't wait till uh, some of them people, some of those people read the, uh, the their stories. Uh, Mary they jo probably need to buy three or four copies to share for their friends. <laughs> I, plan, I, plan, I plan to make sure that they're aware because most of the people that I talk about are not aware at all of some impact they may have had on my life and my life of faith. And so the, to the worshiping community, this to me is a valuable lesson for all of us. Uh, it, I, I, I did write about this. I don't know if it takes a village to raise a child, but I do know it takes a worshiping community to communicate the gospel. And uh, a worshiping community is what is required for us to help pass 
as the Hebrew understood so clearly, you know, this way of knowing, including knowing God, can only be passed down if we're really intentional about it and focus and pour ourselves into the lives of, of others. Uh, in, in this case, we're talking about next generation. So I was, I was uh, affected, touched by um, the, the Covenant Presbyterian Church I grew up in and the nurture that they gave me, the affirmation that they gave me, um, even before I had a memory uh, as, as they brought me to the front and had me recite a poem for a Christmas program that I never even remember doing. But over the years, I remember people saying, oh yeah, the time you did that poem, it was it really blessed my soul. And so uh, I know this is way off the straying well, subject that you intended to focus on this idea of structuring to worship, to bring people into worship. But um, I think the, the bigger picture is that we all are part of that family that communicates the good news of Christ and, and draws people into the presence, uh, the living presence of God. Well, I would say, like, one of the reasons, oh, go ahead. No, you may want to bring us back to the conversation. I will, but one of the reasons as to why I picked the Psalms is also because in our modern culture, worship is seen sometimes as a just something that you do on your own, and people sometimes skip that whole family of God part, and and I think you unintendedly just showed, I mean, like, worship is meant to be in community, uh, in the, and so I think that's important what you've shared there. Uh, even even if you think it was off course, I, I'm just saying it is amazing to me how people um, remember and maybe don't even appreciate until they're older just how good the church was to them and how they were formed and shaped by that. But anyway, um, no, it, that's fine in the conversation. Um, if there is anything that you want to talk about, particularly the the worship in the Old Testament and or how the Psalms shape the New Testament, we can do that too, or however you want to do that. Just briefly, the, uh, I see um, the Psalms idea of worship is not different than the Genesis idea of worship, not different than the New Testament understanding of worship. Uh, and I think the reformed format has in some ways captured what you were talking about, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Uh, a, a movement in worship uh, from recognizing God, the creator, who God is, and moving from that to getting to know this creator God who's interested in my life uh, uh, and invites me into a, a bigger life, a better life, a life an eternal life through, through Jesus. And um, so even if you, whether you have a formal or informal worship, I think it's important that we keep those parameters and those movements in mind that is biblical um, and uh, and Psalms I think reiterates that in lots of ways there's nothing out of bounds for the psalmist uh, nothing that you can't bring into the presence of God uh, your agony is as much a part of we what sometimes in church we we put on this our best face uh, we um, we uh, come as if we don't have flaws or failures or problems, and uh, everybody looks around with those pretty clothes and pretty faces, and we forget that in as we come to worship, we also have brokenness, and we have needs, and we have sin, and we have uh, desperation in some cases, and, uh, and depression in some cases. My goodness, this COVID nonsense has really... Uh, given us all um, a, a little case of, uh, of the blues in some ways. So that too is part of worship. I don't think uh, we, don't, we need to sanitize our worship. We bring ourselves, and some churches are afraid of that. Some of us in our churches are afraid um, of bringing the raw hurt. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's, we have missed something powerful in worship by leaving that out. I think then that that leads us to the, that last section, which is lamentation. Um, and, oh, and I, I want to say something before we go to lamentation, please. Yes, please, please, please. Okay, I just want to bring a practical example of uh, one of the songs that always ministered to me. I mean, it's song. It's like uh, Psalms. One or two verses can tell a whole story, can preach all the sermon, like 
Psalm 48, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, uh, the joy of the old heart. It's like with that alone, I mean, there's that song that I, I love to sing. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of the Lord, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth. Is Mount Zion on the side of the northern city of the great king. Is Mount Zion on the side of the northern city of the great king. That's from the KJV version. So, I mean, like, that's just verses one and two of that old psalm. It tells the whole lot of story. Whatever situation I'm going in, God is great. It's beautiful for that situation. So, Psalms really helps. It preaches to us. I mean, even though it is sung, I mean, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're good, because I did want to bring that up. That's one reason why I also wanted to bring back a study of the Psalms. So uh, one of the concerns that I have as a Christian education person within the denomination is that we're losing the vocabulary of faith or the vocabulary of praise, and we're missing some beautiful words, beautiful phrases. The way you say things are beautiful or the way things are sung, and we try... Um, I guess out of a desire to make things so accessible, sometimes we shortcut the religious imagination or the worship imagination or those worship songs or phrases that you find in the, like, you know, like Psalm 48, that's a beautiful way of saying something, but we no longer would say something that way. We would, <laughs> we would dumb it down as much as possible. And so I do like the fact that you brought that out. The Psalms are beautiful just on their own accord, but they're even more beautiful when it's when it's uh, worship from the heart, the people of God to God and saying beautiful words, just pretty beautiful words. I love it. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I meant to say that. Um, so then uh, Dr. Qualls, you had started to talk about it. And then Dr. D, you're the one that got into these two lessons. And, and I'm, I'm afraid, like Doc Qualls said, maybe sometimes we're not comfortable with the rawness of of complaining or feeling hurt before God. Sometimes people think that like, if they feel bad or if they're in pain, they don't go to God because maybe they don't have enough faith or that. But in the Psalms, boy, if somebody was having a problem, they let God know about it. <laughs> if they were hurting, if David was hurting, he took it to God and, and he would use vivid language to express his grief and even disappointment. And so um, the last two chapter or the last two sections of the encounter for the for the summer is is what is lamentation? What does it mean to cry out to God in pain? And then how? And then the reason why I had the communal part, the first part was from Psalm one forty two, uh, just a cry to God. But the the second psalm was meant to talk about how we as a church or as people, how how do we have a collective lament or collective grief and try to deal with it in such a way that. Um, it doesn't lead to strife all the time or people to groups being mad at each other. How, but how do we communally lament as well? So anyway, I will let uh, Dr. D, do you want to start this one since you, you got these two last lessons and I'll let you. Let uh, you yes, yes, I, yes, I can. Lamentation like you uh, rightly put us in the right path as to be, I mean, coming in our pains, coming in our brokenness uh, before God to let God out. Let God know that we are hurting. And when we are hurting, we are hurting. It's no point trying to mask things. It's no point trying to sugarcoat things. I come from a culture that uh, uh, everything is rooted uh, in faith and in religion. Even when people are dying, it's like, a, uh, how are you doing? Uh, the response is, oh, give God the glory. Thank God, I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm like, not really doing okay. You haven't eaten. You need some money for you to be able to eat. Uh, yes, I know, but I'm, I'm doing okay. It's like want to be seen as people of faith. We want to be seen as a, a strong believer, strong in quote, because I mean, I don't believe there is a strong or a weak believer. It's either you believe or you don't. Uh, and once you believe, your belief might be, your, your faith might be shaky. I've been trying to figure out how is God going to do this, but uh, you can tell God, I believe, help 
my shaky <laughs> belief. Um, so we, we lament when we go through, when we go through, when we're in our wilderness. And um, a lot of times, even when we're in the wilderness, uh, we are not there to be punished. We are there to, uh, to, to learn something, to, to see what we probably don't see if we are not in the wilderness. Let's take an example of being in the wilderness and not having water. We saw how the Israelites, uh, how they reacted to Moses, how they were made at all. They even have water to drink. This water is, is bad. You brought us here to kill us and all that. Uh, they never saw the importance of water, even while they had it. Even when God was giving them manna, they said they don't like this. Uh, some of them, some translations, it's called stupid manna. We don't, we don't want this stupid food. They wanted onions and cucumbers that, that they are used to. It's like, as human beings, we, we kind of uh, get used to what we want the way we want it. And when we are in a wilderness, when we are in a place of sorrow, of lament, we begin to see things differently. Like, okay, things are not usually like this for everyone or even for us all of the time. And we uh, ought to be able by the grace of God to say, God, I mean, I am hurting. I don't like this. I don't come to my aid. Uh, what have I done? I don't even know what I've done. I mean, I mean for us just to be sincere with God, uh, like uh, I love uh, scriptures uh, in the Old Testament where we see people that, okay, like David cover himself with ashes. I mean, when they are like lamenting, I mean, put themselves in a situation that it's not a situation of comfort. We want to take care of our comfort no matter what we are going through. Like now that we are we're in the, in the Lent, Lent season, um, I mean, I'm not saying that you have to show everybody what you're doing. I mean, do it in the closet of your room, but then you don't have to be like, okay, oh, I just want to look great all the time, you know, that I want to be who I was even when don't have no sense of uh, depravity sometimes. And we need that so that we can be in a place of brokenness, not because we want to be broken, not because it's, um, it's a ritual or a tool. I mean, uh, I, I take that back, not because it's a, a must-do thing that will get us closer to God, no but because it's something that we do for us to be able to pay closer attention. I mean, no matter what we do, it's not going to make God change. It's not going to make God love us more or love us less. And if we, I mean, whatever we do, it's not by works. So but when we do the works, the works that we do, we are doing it for our own self, not for God. And when we do it for our own self and we know better, just like we uh, said at the beginning that uh, Motive of either you are wise or you are foolish uh, runs through the gamut of the Bible. And so it's always important for us to uh, know our limitation, know that we are, uh, we, we, we are in stress and ask God who can be our help to help us. Yeah, that's good. Um, Dr. Qualls? Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, probably, I have good ideas. Probably was not by intention except by the providential understanding of God who gave direction even when you, you didn't know it. Um, but you have now come full circle back around to the idea of the two paths um, that, uh, you know, everybody has the option to choose to walk the path of God or to choose one of our own choosing. And if we chose the path, none of us would ever go path that leads to darkness or difficulty or struggle and and yet uh, often that's where God does the best work is when we're in those difficult places and we feel desperate and helpless uh, sometimes hopeless and cry out um, I uh, many years ago I attended a class on the Psalms uh, Eugene Peterson taught uh, which was such a wonderful, it was a spirituality class. And the day I was supposed to leave to go to the class in California, uh, we buried my dad. And a year before that, we had buried my brother, who's just about a year and a half older than me. And if you ever have a chance to hear me talk about that, you'll know how profoundly my life was affected by those grieving, the grieving of those events. Uh, and 
one evening during the class, it was there was lots of time for us to meditate and be quiet and and spend time. And you know, it couldn't have come at a better time for me, uh, a healing time for me. I needed a desperate time. I needed, but one night the cohort was from all over the country, um, all over the world. I was the only one from the south, and we all went out to eat one night at a local restaurant. And afterwards five of us decided for whatever reason, you know, we would take the next car. We, these people would go back to the class and we were going to, we're just going to sit and visit for a little while. Little did we know that as we began to talk with each other and talk about our lives, all these were ministers, all the, uh, many of them quite successful in their ministry, but four of the five had recently experienced the kind of loss of someone close to them, a brother or a spouse or a, a, a parent that had, uh, I, this first time I ever heard the phrase that I use often when I talk about it, that had, as ministers, we go into paramedic mode and take care of people, take care of the people in our lives is what we do in our congregation. And in my case, you know, my, my brother and my father were members of my congregation. So I was their pastor. And and, and each of us had these stories to tell uh, of deep um, difficulty, struggle, that very few people ever knew about because we have this understanding that we, we have to have it all together at all times. Uh, we can't show weakness or struggle, um, even the pain of grief sometimes is thought of as off limits. And so I guess from that, as I said, I've been profoundly affected by that. Just hearing others share that we're in the same place, uh, struggling to try uh, to grapple with a real difficulty of a, a, a loss, a terrible loss. In fact, there wasn't a single one of the four of us who wasn't pretty mad I'm at God. Uh, and and so being able to express that and find out, by the way, you're not the only one in the world that feels that way. And by the way, God understands our heart better than we right. do ourselves. And so that was, for me, a very profound moment and has, as I said, affected me in that I encourage, and every time the church gathers for worship, there are some people who are struggling on the edge with hope and hopelessness, with life and death. Um, and sometimes that person is on the other side of the sacred desk. So please be aware that everybody is human and we all struggle with those same things. And, and also I think the Psalms not only give us permission, but also guidance to be able to go to God when we're even mad at God. Like you said, the, the term mad, I mean, He's a big God, right? He's going to take it. Uh, and he cares. God cares deeply for, for us. And oh, yes. so that's, that's awesome. Um, all right. Uh, hallelujah. That's response. Hallelujah. 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 Um, Amen. <laughs> I will open it up maybe for if y'all want to just any parting shots. Um, and thank y'all very much again for your work. Um, I'm deep, deeply appreciative of it. Um, also, uh, after this, I'll, I'll ask everybody for maybe, uh, if you have something online, I think Dr. D you said you have an online, uh, ministry. Uh, if I can get that link from you, I'll make sure it's put up on all these things that I publicize. And that way, Dr. Qualls, of course, I'll get some stuff for the house of Pres Cumberland house, Cumberland Presbyterian house studies and stuff like that. But, um, anyway, if y'all want to give any parting shots or, or whatnot, and then we'll, will be done. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I want I want to close with a memory verse of the two uh, Psalms that I, I handle. Uh, the first one, uh, Psalm 142, verses 1 and 2. With my voice, I cry to the Lord. With my voice, I make supplication to the Lord. I pour out my complaint for him. I tell my trouble for him. So we are encouraged to voice uh, 
our complaints, our troubles, our hearts to the Lord. I mean, talking of uh, personal and individual uh, lamentation, uh, we encourage to tell God how we feel, what we feel, what our pains are. I mean, in in in, in psychology, we know we uh, or there's this common saying that a problem shared is half solved. How much more if it's shared with God, our own Creator? Uh, the second memory verse, uh, Psalm 79, verses 8 and 9. Do not remember, this is now talking about the communal uh, uh, lamentation. Do not remember against us the iniquities of our ancestors. Let your compassion come speedily to us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. So, I mean, that is, uh, if we say we have no sin, we are lying and the truth is not in us. And as a body, as a community, and as a church, uh, I want to encourage us to uh, move a step further away from the common recital of uh, uh, confessional uh, prayers in church that, okay, we're just reading this without us uh, putting our mind to it that this is real and uh, we can grieve together as a community and God can always deliver us. He can always uh, forgive us for his own name's sake. Thank you. Yeah. So for me, um, one of the most difficult parts of writing the lessons was to um, to try to get in touch with, stay in touch with that binary understanding of the Hebrew where you have this path to choose and you go this way, or you take this path and that way. So the fool said in his heart, there is no God. And, um, and uh, for me, the hardest part then was not to let that be a springboard for my arrogance okay. to say, uh, yes, well, I've, I've chosen the right path. You and I and the rest of us who are here on this path, we've chosen the right path. We're great. And they have chosen the wrong path. They're fools. I said in their heart, there's no God. Um, but if you follow that verse, that, that same Psalm, you discover that this, when the spirit of God came down to look around, there were fools everywhere. Mm -hmm. no, it, it, it's not so so for me some of you won't find it hard to believe that i struggle with that binary understanding you know this is these people are good these people are not good good and wicked righteous and and wicked uh, fools and and wise but um but i find that the grace of god is sufficient yeah. that's that's what i ultimately like to say about all that the grace of god is sufficient uh, and it's not an it should not inspire arrogance on our part, uh, but awe and humility on our part. So I hope those people who pray the Psalms with us through the summer, uh, and it's not just about looking at them or, or even studying them. It's about getting into them and praying them. Uh, I hope those people who pray the Psalm with us this summer will just be flooded with the grace of God and, uh, and come out with a, a beautiful, bright, understanding of uh, who God has called them to be. And amen. I, yeah, amen. amen. I say amen to that. I think the last thing that I'll, and this will be my parting shot for everybody again, is thank you both very much. And um, I'm appreciative of it. I think another reason why I wanted to make sure we hit on the Psalms is, again, I've said, um, not a lot of preachers preach out of the Psalms because they don't lend themselves to that. You're a sinner. Or let me instruct you a couple of ways. They're formative. You have to read them, pray about them, think about them, let them let them in your soul for a little while. And that's what I also hope happens over the, the course of the summer is that as folks read the Psalms, they they play with them in their minds and hearts and let them let it sink in and form and shape our thinking uh, a little bit in a different way than just hearing a sermon where somebody gives us three points in a poem. Right. So um, but anyway, again, thank you all very much. And I'm appreciative of you giving your time for me today. And, and I know the church will be indebted to you for your service to, to the church. And, and so thank you very much. And God bless you all in your ministries. Thank you, Chris.
Thank you, Dr. Penny. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Yes, sir. Um, uh, I would like to have uh, Dr. Professor Reverend Christopher Fleming's uh, email so I can send the link to him. I will. Uh, all right. Uh, it's C. Flint. Well, I'll send it to you, but it's uh, I can tell you C. Fleming at Cumberland.org. Oh, OK. So as long as you got the Cumberland.org part, C. Fleming, F-L-E-M-I-N-G. And anybody can reach me there. If you're nice, I'll respond. <laughs> I think I've uh, copied you also be uh, with his email address. Back in the OK. Yeah, I think what I can do is uh, I, I have your email address. For some reason, I couldn't pull it up but I'll get it. And uh, again, thank you all very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, Dr.